back to the Ruderman Roundtable. It's an every other week program here on Think Tech Hawaii where we talk about good government issues and other issues related to our society here in Hawaii. I'm Senator Russell Ruderman, your host. I'm the state senator from Puna and Ka'u districts on the Big Island. My guest today is Kat Brady. Welcome, Kat. Thank you, Senator. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Kat is uh, the coordinator of the Community Alliance on Prisons. Yes. Also executive director of Life of Land. Assistant Life executive director. I'm sorry. <laughs> Assistant executive director of Life of the Land. Legislative coordinator, coordinator for the Hawaii Juvenile Justice Project. Mm. And the legislative coordinator, coordinator for the ACLU of Hawaii. No, I haven't done that in a few years, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I've done a lot of civil okay. rights stuff. And you're and involved in numerous other organizations. Yes, as yes, well. all community, all the time. Wonderful. Thank you for all the work that you do. By the way, <laughs> thank you. It's always a pleasure seeing yourself and Henry around the Capitol. I always, uh, it's it's heartwarming to me to see a couple of real people working for the public good <laughs> yeah. uh, advocating among the people at the Capitol. Thank you. So a lot of times we talk about good govern good governance and good government issues on the program and that's an interest of yours also. Yes, it really is. I guess I've been doing this about 20 years and over that time I've seen the government actually move away from the people where it's harder to get information. And that to me is, you know, democracy is dependent on a vibrant community that is participating. And yet it's really hard to participate if you can't get information. So it's, um, that has been a real issue for us. And you know, good governance really is dependent on accountability, transparency, following the rule of law, you know, things like that, being responsive to the community, being inclusive. And yet I, I've seen government move further and further away, both federal and state and county government move further away from the people. And I find that really disheartening. And when we ask why don't people want to be involved, I can say for over the 20 years I've been at the legislature representing the community, the number of community people that actually come and testify has really dwindled. Mm. On certain issues, you'll get a lot of people that turn up, but there used to be a consistent group of community folks who were out there on a number of issues, and it's now mostly paid lobbyists. Why do you think that changed? Why has it gotten worse instead of better? I think money and politics is a huge problem. <laughs> is money and politics really? Tell and me I, about that. Yeah, I think that's a huge problem when people can actually buy a position. And that is, um, that has really disenfranchised the community who feel like, well, my voice doesn't matter. And I have a, a big justice list and I'm always saying, your voice does matter because we are the government. And, you know, you're a senator that was elected to represent the people, and we're the people. And um, I'm really happy that you're there because you do represent the people and you always speak about your district and Hawaii and what's good and how to move the state forward. But there are some that um, consider the elected position a job and they do their job and they go home. <laughs> and I think you kind of live it. Your business and your um, legislative experience is evidence of that. I see you in your oh. stores when I go to the Big Island. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Kat. I appreciate that. Um, what, are, what would you say are the main characteristic, characteristics of good governance? Well, I think accountability is first and foremost, and it's especially important to me because I work on justice issues, and the one thing we ask for people who break the law, be accountable. Mm. So we want our government to be accountable. We think transparency is absolutely crucial for accountability, and following the rule of law uh, is something when the state doesn't follow the law, <laughs> how can they hold the citizens um, to be accountable when they're not leading by example. I think good governance is being responsive to the community and really hearing what they're saying. Not what you want to hear, but hearing what the community is saying that 
many times things you don't want to hear, but you need to hear them anyway. It's also about being equitable, inclusive, and just in the work I do in justice, when I look at the prison population, our prisons are brown. Our prisons are full of Hawaiians, Polynesians, Filipinos. I was born and raised in New York where the prisons are black and Latino. So it's very hard to say that, you know, things are equitable. Mm -hmm. They're not. Um, another thing is about being um, effective and efficient. And I know this administration is talking about being efficient, and we agree with being efficient, but not at the expense of the community voice. And participation, to me, is really crucial. You know, in the opening of the legislature, um, I read this speech of the Senate president who said, you know, democracy isn't who has the loudest voice. And I thought to myself, wow, democracy is based on dissent. How do they think, you know, America happened? <laughs> so, so I think we need to understand that dissent is a very important part. And, you know, policy making is really about being deliberative and being deliberative doesn't mean you're talking to the choir. It means you're taking in all the different sides of an issue and coming out with the best possible policy for, you know, time. What do you think gets in the way of that? Why can't we achieve that? I think ego is a big problem. Um, and just, you know, I guess I consider elected positions as public service. Um, sure. It is public service. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people who take positions, um, you know, they earn less working for the government than they would in their own field, but they feel a compelling uh, pull to actually make their community better. Um, and I really honor that. I think that's really wonderful. But I think the, there are some people who get elected who really believe that it's about them, and it isn't. It's really about not only your district, but all of Hawaii. How will that decision impact Hawaii? And I think one of the things that I have discovered over the years is the unintended consequences that happen when bills pass without enough real thought mm -hmm. put into them. And then we see later on, ooh, you know, that's a problem <laughs> that we should have thought about before. So that's why I'm really about, you know, more discussion, more open discussion, more inclusive discussion with the community. Because people who testify, they're actually coming to tell you what, they, what their opinion is on something. And it's very frustrating to the community, they've told me, when they testify and there is either nobody, nobody except there. the chair at the table or everybody's on their, <laughs> their phone. And they feel like they're not heard. And I keep telling people, you know, you are testifying in front of the committee, but that goes all over the Capitol. So you're actually educating everybody in the building, everybody in that hearing. <laughs> so your voice is important, and always it's about educating. Interesting. You know, I've, I, I, I've been guilty of what you're saying sometimes myself, and uh, sometimes it's uh, I've heard one testifier come in and say, good morning, chair, vice chair, and empty chairs. Because <laughs> that's who he's speaking to. <laughs> so, so it's important for legislators to be there to listen to the testimony, but also to um, be open to really hearing even those other points of view. Yeah, there, yeah. So. And not to challenge to receive that information, because I've been in hearings where legislators have actually attacked mm -hmm. um, some testifiers. And, you know, I've seen testifiers leave in tears. And I'm thinking, no, this is your government. Yeah. You should not be in tears. You just offered, you know, your opinion on something. And that's valuable. You shouldn't feel bad about that. Mm -hmm. But she was badgered by someone. And it really was, it really made me feel bad because it made me realize that legislature didn't really understand what the position <laughs> I hope that person are. didn't give up. I uh, might try no, again sometime. She here. didn't. <laughs> so from time to time, uh, bills come along to try to improve government's responsiveness, right? And mm -hmm. I'm sure you've been involved in trying to pass some of them. <laughs> yeah. 
What is it that keeps such bills from passing? Well, you know, one of the things about accountability and transparency is getting access to do government docket, documents that are public documents. Um, and that we would have to pay for them is kind of insulting. Mm -hmm. And I understand it does take staff time to find them, but, you know, some agencies charge 10 cents a page and some charge 50 cents. So it shouldn't be a revenue generating thing. <laughs> so to me, when you have open government, you really try to keep things at the minimum so that almost everybody has access. You know, the costs at a minimum. But what, what <laughs> let's say when a, when a good government bill comes up and is under discussion, and it, it typically doesn't pass, right? What, what kills those bills? I want to say there's really, there hasn't been a political will, and, and I'll give you an example. In the voting bills, that has been so difficult to pass voting bills because then we hear, you know, voices in the wilderness going, oh, there's voter fraud. Well, where's the evidence? Yeah, we don't. To me, I want to see the research. I want to see the evidence. I don't want to hear anecdotal information that we can't do this because somebody thinks this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So um, that's been, voter fraud has been the big rubric about why we can't pass voter laws. Even though it's embarrassing that we're like in the bottom. Or the lowest. Yeah, the lowest I mean, turnout. you know, you, you hear, oh, Iraq had elections and, you know, people were lined up and they were so grateful to vote and we can't move people off the couch. It's like something is wrong and it's wrong because people feel they have no cachet. They have no, they have no influence in their own government. So to me, restoring trust in government is really everything. And so I think the voter bills always have a difficult time. Any kind of, well, like the legislature doesn't have to follow the Sunshine Law and other laws that other people, you know, have to follow. Mm -hmm. And it's those kinds of things that make, makes the community kind of feel um, like you're privileged and we're down here. So it and sounds I don't like, mean you personally. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like sort of a catch-22. People don't feel involved because they don't feel like they can make a difference, and then therefore they don't vote, and then they're, they become even less involved. Yes. It's sort of a vicious cycle that we're... It is. And I think, you know, a few years ago they tried to, at the Board of Ed, take uh, civics out of school. Uh -huh. And I thought, oh my God, that is... That's shameful yeah. <laughs> because people should understand how laws are made and that they have some, you know, some input into that. And yet, um, wow, it's, <laughs> it's, people don't feel that. And I think that's a problem. So we, how do we restore the trust in government, I think, is really the question. And it's by being open and transparent. So we really have currently no idea what direction the state is taking. There's really been no um, vision outlined. And I think that's kind of scary. Um, we're in really tumultuous times in the world. And I think Hawaii is just in an, an amazing position just by where we are geographically. Um, and what we know, because as an island state, we have learned so much about climate change, how to deal with, you know, disasters. I mean, we could, we could be a lab for the world. <laughs> sure could, and in many ways we are. I think we just need, we can do a little bit better job. Of yes. It. Now we have to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a minute. Okay. Thank you, Kat. We'll be back in just a moment with the Ruderman Roundtable here on Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, my name is Aaron Wills. You are watching thinktechhawaii.com. I am the host of the show, Rehabilitation Coming Soon. You can watch us live at thinktechhawaii.com at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays. I will see you there. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna, and I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I invite you to come watch our show on thinktechhawaii.com. You can also see our shows on YouTube. 
as well, if you can Google search those. I appreciate the time. I hope that you do join us as we learn about education, about the educational system here in Hawaii, what the challenges are, what the benefits are, and how much our kids are learning. So thank you. I hope you join us. Welcome back to the Ruderman Roundtable on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman here with Kat Brady, who, among other things, is the coordinator of the Community Alliance on Prisons. So, Kat, a minute ago we were talking about good government and what, what keeps government from being more responsive and the vicious cycle that makes make it apparently worse in the last 10 or 20 years. If, if you could do one or two things that would improve the situation, what would that be? Well, I guess I would um, say that people could access government documents for five or ten cents a page, all agencies, so that it doesn't become a revenue-generating thing. Um, and I guess I would also, um, well, I like that the senators and representatives send out their newsletters, because I think that's really good to for people who never make it down to the legislature. They actually can see what's going on. So I think more of that kind of stuff, but if a, if a newsletter like that actually came out of the governor's office that talked about what each agency, what's the vision of each agency, I think that could galvanize the community to actually think, wow, um, maybe I can help out there or maybe I can you know, do something in that area that I wasn't aware of. So I think it's all about communication, and um, that's been really uh, kind of lacking. Now that last idea would be pretty easy to try, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not oh yeah. Cost too much to have an email newsletter available for the whole state. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we should suggest it to the governor. Just so people it. know what each agency does, because yeah. not everybody does. That's true. So I'm still trying to figure it out myself. Yeah. <laughs> So in addition to your work on good government, uh, you've been very active in uh, prison reform in yes. particular. Um, I know one, one of the big issues in prisons is the overcrowding. Mm -hmm. And so where do we, how do we begin to address that? Well, the first thing we need to know is overcrowding is not a new issue. <laughs> and we were under a 15-year consent decree in 19, from 1985 to 2000 where the, the federal government was going to take over the prison system because it was so completely overcrowded. And um, after the consent decree was over, <laughs> we kind of went back to where everything was. But the consent decree kind of started the, in 1995, we started shipping people to private prisons. And that has been a very bad thing <laughs> because they're only dependent on money. I mean, that's, they are in the business for the money. So rehabilitation, not so much, but you know, um, send that check, keep the beds warm and the money flowing. So that has really changed criminal justice. And I, I am on lists all of, with people all around the world, and everybody says the same thing, that um, private prisons have definitely impacted the criminal justice system in a very negative way. And, you know, a lot of the private, well, the private prisons are basically supported by the Koch brothers. Mm. And they're um, the main supporters of the American Legislative Exchange, mm. ALEC. And, you know, their whole thing is really about being very punitive. And that's where three strikes and all these, you know, laws came from. And we started sending people in 1995, we sent the first 300 people in the week between Christmas and New Year's. The ACOs went into the cells about 2 a.m. and said, pack your stuff, you're leaving. And ferreted the guys to the airport and um, shipped them to Texas. And their families didn't know, nobody knew where they, I mean, it was, there was no advance notice, no anything. So they were, our people have been on quite a tour, Texas, Tennessee, Minnesota, the women have been to Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Arizona. Colorado. Um, no, the women weren't in Arizona, but okay. in Kentucky, where they were sexually assaulted even by the um, chaplain. So really, um, 
the facilities are, private prisons are, uh, they, they come to Hawaii, they choose who to take. So they don't take any of the people who are difficult. Oh, gosh, <laughs> They're really non-union. So, you know, when we talk about uh, our costs and their costs, it's not the same thing mm. because it's really apples and oranges because they get to choose the easy guys. <laughs> now tell me, when a prisoner gets sent far away to a distant state, it's not just uh, heartbreaking for their families, but it also has very s specific negative consequences towards their recidivism oh, or rehabilitation rate. Right? Totally. There's lots of research on the importance of connection, mm -hmm. of keeping people connected with positive, with their families, with positive role models. And I think probably the premier study was done in California several years ago and it basically showed people who had three sets of visits by three different people a year, um, their recidivism was so low no as kidding. opposed to somebody who had no visits, their recidivism were really high. So keeping prisoners connected to their families, it's yes. not just the humane thing to do, but it's also the pragmatic thing yes. to do in terms of... Uh, yes, it's the course. efficient thing to do. Thing to do. And yeah. that's why it's kind of upsetting that at Halava, we have guys in stripes, striped uniforms. This is like the, you know, a, 19, a bad 1940s movie. <laughs> and we have non-contact visits. And it's really difficult. There's a thick glass between, and I've heard from people who've been on those visits that they have to have their ear right up to the glass. They can't even hear. So I think about kids visiting daddy at Halava, and I just think, what kind of image does that leave with the child? Daddy's a criminal. Ooh. Can't even touch her hug, huh? Yeah. What else can we do about overcrowding? Well, you know, it's interesting. Whenever things are overcrowded, the first thing we hear is, we need to build more. And I'm saying, no, not really. Look at what's happening in the world. I mean, reform is happening all over. Jurisdictions are getting rid of mandatory minimums. Oh, Hawaii is still making them. But <laughs> we're like, we're the outliers. Mm. Um, because I mean, we're still passing mandatory minimums. Yes, yes. We are. And, you know, it, justice reinvestment is something that um, has been embraced by the Department of Justice, and that's that's something that really looks at the prison system about reducing prison, the prison population and putting people into community programs that are more appropriate to address their pathway to crime. Mm -hmm. So sentence reform, justice reinvestment, there are so many things we can do. There are so many people who don't need to be inside. Recently, I believe we passed a bill that allowed the, the director of, of the Public Safety Division to release certain nonviolent prisoners at his Well, uh, misdemeanants. Misdemeanants and petty misdemeanants. But who are in prison. Right? Yes, yes who are in jail. And um, basically that bill got weakened, so oh, probably about three people will oh, is that get right? out. <laughs> so the choice is really build more and more and more prisons or have sentencing and justice reform so that people who don't belong in prison are no longer in prison. Yeah, and let's build safe, healthy, and just communities. And if we really start looking at the communities where people come from, mm -hmm. we need to look at that, do mapping there. What kind of economic opportunities do they have? Are there schools in the neighborhood? Are there programs that kids can go to? You know, these are the kinds of things we could do, and it's not really rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, you don't look like someone who spent a lot of time in prison. And, uh, <laughs> what, make, what brought you into uh, being so concerned with the issues? Well, because as? I'm an environmentalist. Oh. And in the 80s, I was trying to figure out where the heck is all the money going? Hmm. We had money in the 80s. In the 90s, we were broke. I was like, what happened? So I went down to the budget office. I got three big red budget books. And of course, they're not in English. You got to crack the code, right? So I was like, oh my God, how do you read this thing? <laughs> so then I realized at the beginning of every session, every department goes before the budget committees and they submit a sheaf of documents. That's where the codes are. So I downloaded that, I got the codes, then I could figure out the code for the department, the code for each prison, and then every, 
every division has multiple codes within that division. <laughs> but I was finally able to crack the code, and that showed me that our prison budget was the one that was constantly rising, and I was like, well, who's in there? So and then this I... here in Hawaii. Yeah. Uh -huh. So then it started me on the vision quest, <laughs> and I finally realized that most people are in there for drugs or drug-related crimes. So then I started looking how much drug treatment we have. Oh, not much. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but a lot of people in prison who still are doing drugs because they're getting them in prison. Mm -hmm. Well, really, the explosion in our prison population was tied to mandatory uh, sentencing laws and the three strikes you're out. Uh, yeah, the 90s, the 90s, yeah. Right. A lot so. of the Clinton laws that were, um, yeah, truth in sentencing and all, all those kinds mm -hmm. of laws. And the rubric of the super predators mm -hmm. has, that really, <laughs> pun intended, colored the justice system because then it really started going after people of color. So, by the way, thank you for doing the advocacy work that you do, and I think very few people are, advocate so much for something that doesn't benefit themselves directly. Yeah. So thank you for the compassion. Well, it benefits our community. Have, yeah. <laughs> Tell me, uh, uh, you're very involved with um, the Community Alliance on Prisons, as well as the uh, Life of the Land. Yes. If someone, someone wants to get involved with either or both of those uh, organizations, tell us how we can find you and okay. how can we get involved. I'm not that hard to find. Okay. <laughs> My email is kat, K-A-T dot C-A-P-H-I at gmail.com. And for Life of the Land, it's cat um, Brady at Life of the Land. No, it's cat dot Life of the Land at gmail.com. <laughs> well, that's how about a website for the organization themselves if they um, want to get started? Actually, um, oh God, I'm on okay. Facebook. Right. Uh, <laughs> go sure to Community been, Alliance been, on Prisons on Facebook. There we go. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm not and, too savvy. And you welcome anybody media. to get involved? Anyone that's interested can get involved and become a member, perhaps? Or, uh, yes, find out we need they... lots of help. We need lots of people in the community to actually start speaking out because incarceration has touched just about every family in Hawaii. Okay, good. Well, thank you. I'm here with Kat Brady, and I want to thank you for joining us today, Kat. And thanks once again to Think Tech Hawaii for hosting the Ruderman Roundtable. I'm Senator Russell Ruderman. We'll see you again on Tuesday afternoon, two weeks from now. Mahalo.